Greetings everyone, today I am covering a classic tilt shift lens from Canon, their TSE 17mm f4L. It originally came out all the way back in 2009, but it's still highly regarded and available for about 2200 US dollars or just about 2000 pounds here in the UK, so it's a very expensive option, but also pretty unique and valuable to the right user. It's a manual focus only lens, although you can adjust its aperture using your camera and you do get EXIF information stored in your files. Many of you will already know what a tilt shift lens is by now, but here's a recap just in case. The shift function here, up to 12mm on this lens, enables you to correct your perspective for architecture photography or any other kind of photography where keeping straight lines straight is important. Yes, you can do this to your pictures in editing software too, but that will degrade your final image quality quite a bit, and there's nothing quite like getting it right when you're there in the field. You can also rotate this lens so that it shifts from left to right, or any angle in between. And another neat trick is that it can be used to make easily stitchable panorama images. Just shift the lens all the way to the left, take a shot, and then to the right, take another shot, and make sure to keep the exposure the same by shooting in manual mode, and then stitch them together in editing for a high resolution panorama. Neat! So that shift function is pretty useful for architecture or landscape photography. And the lens's tilt function allows you to literally tilt the front element of the lens, and pretty far too. This has the effect of adjusting your plane of focus. For example, here we have a close up shot of my toddler's building blocks and, as you'd expect, the clocks further away are out of focus. If I tilt the lens just so, I can adjust the plane of focus to include the whole line of them, so that's a feature which is mainly used for product photography. You can rotate the tilt mechanism of the lens 360 degrees for just the right focus. Because of this lens's extreme wide angle really, it's going to be much more used for architecture photography than product photography, so the shift function is going to be my key interest for this review video. But it is nice to know that the tilt feature is there too if you're ever doing something unusual and need to have it. Let's look at the build quality. I hate to use such a tired cliche, but the lens really is built like a tank. It's very metallic and very tough, so at least you should get your £2,000 worth in long term use. It's based on a metal lens mount, which surprisingly doesn't have a weather sealing gasket around it. At the rear come the controls for the shift mechanism, and they're very well designed. On the other side, they can be locked in place, but on this side is a good sized dial that lets you adjust it very precisely. Then at the front we have a very very similar mechanism for controlling the lens's tilt. Again, it's very well designed and easy to control with a nice big control dial. Finally, right at the very front there's the focus ring. It works really smoothly, but turns a little loosely, still the precision you need will be there in use. The lens has a very bulbous front element, unavoidable in such a wide angle lens of this kind, so you can forget about using any kind of filter with it. It does come with a special lens hood, made of plastic, which snaps into place reasonably well, although for peace of mind you should probably still take care how you put it away in your camera bag. The lens does not have image stabilisation, and as I've mentioned already, it's manual focus only. Overall, its build quality is pretty much everything you could ask for here. Well, except for weather seeming, strangely. Now onto image quality. I'm testing it by adapting it onto my Canon EOS R5 with its full frame 45 megapixel sensor. Firstly, I'm using the lens normally, unshifted. In the middle of the image at f4, sharpness looks very nice with good contrast. The image corners look very good too, offering a decent amount of resolution. Stop down to f5.6 for more brightness and a tiny bit more sharpness there. f8 looks a tiny bit better again, although overall still not quite razor sharp. The lens stays this sharp down to f11, and it's only at f16 that we begin to see a little softness creeping in from the effects of diffraction. 
so it's an impressive performance for an older lens when it's not shifted. Now let's shift the lens all the way up and see what happens. In the middle of the image at f4, picture quality is softer now with lower contrast and clear astigmatism. There's more horizontal resolution than vertical here, which is kind of what you'd expect to be honest. In the corner that's been stretched the least, we see a decently sharp image though. The corner that's been stretched the most is pretty soft, with some clear colour fringing and darkness from vignetting, not pretty. Stop down to f5.6 and things are just a little clearer in that difficult corner and slightly sharper in the corner that's been stretched the least. However, the middle of the image sees a lot more contrast now and more sharpness. Stop down to f8 and the middle looks excellent, the least stretched corner also excellent. The most difficult corner is now showing more detail, although it's still a bit hazy there. F11 is a tiny bit better and F16 reasonably good. So unsurprisingly, shifting the lens brings in a considerable penalty for image quality only escapable by stopping down the lens's aperture. I would avoid using f4 altogether when shifting the lens or f5.6 unless it's an emergency, stop down to at least f8 or f11 for good results then. Now let's take a look at distortion and vignetting. When the lens is unshifted, we are treated to some moderate barrel distortion and slightly dark corners at f4, stop down to f5.6 and they brighten up again. Now let's shift the lens upwards. There is a slightly stretched distortion pattern now, but nowhere near as bad as I thought it might be. There's a lot of darkness in the top part where the image has been stretched the most. Stop down to f5.6, f8 or f11 to see that slowly get pushed higher up, but it'll always be there, the darkness at least, just a little as you would expect. So some interesting results there. Now let's take a look at close up image quality. This thing can focus down to a very close 25 centimeters. Close up image quality at the maximum aperture of f4 gets a little hazy. Stop down to f5.6 and contrast makes a return, so again, avoid the maximum aperture here. Now let's take a look at how the lens works against bright lights. Its very bulbous front glass element here is surely setting it at a serious disadvantage from the get go. We see a fair bit of glaring and flaring popping up even when the bright lights are not completely in the picture frame. Finally, bokeh. Unless you're getting really close to your subject, then background separation is a bit of a moot point here, but generally, outer focus backgrounds are rendered very softly. Overall, testing this lens out was fun, but its image quality was disappointing. Maybe Canon bit off a bit more than they could chew by making it as wide angle as it is, as the associated challenges in image correction for the lens get much harder as you start tilting and shifting it. There's no doubt in my mind that if you're shifting this lens, you will want to stop down to at least f8 or ideally f16. It's the kind of lens that people are much more likely to hire out than to buy, chiefly because of its astonishingly high price. If you do decide to buy it, then it will work okay for you, but don't be surprised at its quite natural image quality limitations when used at full tilt or full shift on a high resolution camera. You'll probably feel a little short changed, quite frankly.